The state of New York recently enshrined abortion as a legal right up to the birth of the child. And the law was signed and celebrated by Catholic Governor Andrew Cuomo. Are canonical penalties appropriate? Bishop Edward Scharfenberger of Albany, New York, will weigh in. And the accord between China and the Holy See regarding the appointment of bishops is a done deal. But is it working? The retired bishop of Hong Kong and author of the book, For Love of My People, I Will Not Remain Silent, Cardinal Joseph Zen is here with an update. And we'll get story-oriented with author of the Aragon series, Christopher Paolini. He'll tell us about his latest, The Fork, The Witch, and The Worm. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. An important show for you tonight. Bishop Edward Scharfenberger, Joseph Cardinal Zen, and Christopher Paolini are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'll be live tweeting throughout. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. And now, much to get to. First up tonight, the shepherd of the Diocese of Albany, his strong response to New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's support for radically expanding the abortion laws in that state made headlines. Here to tell us how he thinks the church needs to respond to Cuomo's recent actions is Bishop Edward Scharfenberger. He joins us now from Albany. Your Excellency, thank you for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. There are many people who are calling for Governor Cuomo to be excommunicated. Now, you have said you support that, but would use it as a last resort. When is it appropriate or necessary to publicly excommunicate a public official like this? Well, of course, there are different reasons why this particular sanction might be used. And as you said correctly, Raymond, it's a, it's a last resort where nothing else mm -hmm. can be done First of all, to persuade the person that has uh, removed themselves so far from the communion of the church. And the hope, of course, is to persuade them to come back once they've distanced right. themselves. You know, I've heard people say, in a sense, a person excommunicates themselves. And while that's not technically true, so many of the things that Governor Cuomo has done, and in my view, unnecessarily so, uh, you know, running a victory dance around something that I think the, the vast majority of the public see is not a good thing. I mean, some people yeah. may take a position that the freedom should be there to do this, but uh, but I think he completely misread uh, what, how people are seeing mm -hmm. this. So uh, he's kind of embarrassed himself. He's kind of isolated himself, in my view. So uh, do I need to add insult to injury? Uh, who needs to know that what he's done is, is an embarrassment to the Catholic community, an embarrassment to many mm -hmm. people of good conscience? So... Uh, uh, piling on like that, quite frankly, one of my reasons for not doing I'm not hesitant at all. I mean, I, I, we can do this, but, and I think we have reason yeah. to do this, but what good would come from this uh, when, in fact, he's doing a better job than, and I hate to say it this way, than I could in isolating himself from his Catholic beliefs and from, I mm. even think, uh, the, the behavior you would expect from a statesman. Hmm. I want to play this for you. Uh, on his Sirius XM show this week, Cardinal Dolan of, of New York City had this to say in reaction to fellow Catholics talking about excommunicating Governor Cuomo. Listen. What are, what are you all looking at, at, at daddy here? You better do something. You do something. OK, I don't have much clout. Some fat, balding Irish bishop talking about defending the church and talking about how, mm -hmm. how uh, hideous the, this abortion bill is, they're going to say, ho-hum, they have to feel that way. You get committed, thoughtful, yeah. uh, compelling lay people who are speaking up. They got votes, folks. What do you make of the cardinal's comments there? I mean, who else has clout if not the bishop? Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I know d different bishops have, um, have, have said different things. Cardinal Dolan has expressed his way of saying it. I know Bishop mm -hmm. DiMarzio has said that he feels that if uh, excommunication took place, that uh, the governor would wear it as a badge of honor, you know, feeling that he was bullied. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I leave that up to every individual bishop to say. You know, I know Cardinal Dolan uh, uh, has been asked what he would do. Um, uh, he lives in his diocese. 
Uh, people have asked me whether uh, I could excommunicate the governor. Uh, if he, if we can make out that in fact what he did was a, what we call in canon law a delict or a crime, I would have the jurisdiction right. to do that. But I, I frankly think that focusing on uh, punishment, and particularly when excommunication is not meant to do that, but meant to bring a person mm -hmm. back. What I am more concerned about is, uh, yeah, uh, Governor Cuomo has drunk the grape drink and uh, in a form has, has uh, uh, perpetrated this, I think, cancerous uh, ideology that somehow or other mm -hmm. it is a good thing for a woman to be able to destroy her own child. I don't think anybody really believes that. And, uh, yeah. I, and I'm sure those even that voted for the bill uh, would like to downplay that element of it, you know. But here's the thing. Uh, I think that uh, one of the things we really have to have a conversation on nationally is not only what exactly abortion is, but the, mm -hmm. uh, and I can't think of saying it any other way, but a deception to think that somehow or other this advances the freedom and rights of women. And, uh, and that, that is, of course, you know, something I can't say in one soundbite, but I have a lot, to, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of questions about that. And I think, uh, in many ways, second-wave feminism has missed the boat on linking uh, somehow uh, the, uh, whatever you would call it, the freedom to abort your own child is somehow advancing your mm. interest as, as a woman or as a human being. Bishop, have you already had a conversation with Governor Cuomo about his actions? I mean, what role Let me, does a public scandal play in all this? Doesn't a public scandal, well, an act like this, require a public correction of some kind? It, eventually, it, it does. And I think that uh, if my statements uh, up to this point have not adequately made that clear, uh, I will continue to make that clear in a very public way. But uh, conversations, yes, um, uh, bishops typically, including myself, do have conversations with political leaders. We tend not to mm -hmm. uh, advertise that or to make that public or to speak about mm -hmm. with whom we met and when we did. And there's a reason for that. Uh, I want to be able mm -hmm. to open up the opportunity for anybody uh, who wants to speak with me as a pastor and not to feel that, uh, that there is a, a public eye on them. Now, if uh, right. it may come that uh, I may have to say something public, I may have to say that, yes, I have warned somebody if, if it's a negative if it takes on a negative tone but uh, mm -hmm. but I generally would don't, don't discuss those conversations other than to say that I do have them yeah the, the last public excommunication actually took place where I am right now in 1962 in New Orleans when Archbishop Joseph Rummel excommunicated Rummel, yeah. three Catholic mm. leaders here for blocking mm. his uh, efforts to desegregate the Catholic schools why haven't we seen excommunications of politicians who advance something as heinous as abortion. I mean, this is much worse than blocking children from getting to school. It's, 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 it's wanting to liquidate them. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know because those decisions are made by individual bishops, Raymond. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, as you know, the, the bishops of the uh, United States, uh, it, we're not like the Senate, you know, or Congress, mm -hmm. whereby we can come together and issue a lot of time. For example, people have said uh, they would like the bishops of New York State to, you know, to put some sanctions on Governor Cuomo. And not only Governor Cuomo, by the way, but, uh, but even uh, those um, uh, legislators that voted for the bill. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've gotten all sorts of questions. But uh, we, we don't act in, in a concerted, in concert, like as a concerted body, in a group. Uh, each mm -hmm. uh, bishop is responsible for the spiritual care in his own diocese. And it's up to him to decide whether if he uses this sanction, that this will be for the good of, uh, obviously, the individual who is sanctioned, but also for the community. He also has to take into account the consequences uh, in singling out an individual because uh, mm -hmm. it will also uh, uh, perhaps set some sort of a standard that others similarly situated should also be treated the same way. We have to be fair about that. And I've heard mm -hmm. those who have said to me, and I, I don't know whether I agree with this, but that those that actually voted for the legislation in some ways actually are just as responsible, if not even more responsible, than the governor who signed it. I, I realize his despicable behavior, you know, parading mm. the city around in pink lights, right. has really annoyed a lot of people. And, and it's, it is, I understand that. But uh, in, in terms of what actually made this legislation happen, and that having been said, Raymond, we also have to take very seriously the power of our votes. Because uh, we need to know where our uh, representatives stand on issues and to make known how we stand. And I think going forward, we're going to have to do a much, uh, much more uh, effective job at that.
Isn't there a canon, very quickly, Bishop, uh, where a bishop has to also protect the, 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 the sacredness of the sacrament, protect the sacrament itself? Oh, yes. And by allowing yes. a public figure who is manifestly dug in and said, I disagree with the church and I'm still a Catholic, to go forward and take that sacrament, isn't that, isn't that uh, a sacrilege? Yes, you're absolutely right. And the bishop is responsible for preserving the integrity and the sacredness of the sacramental life of the church. That is definitely there. Mm -hmm. Now, we do have a canon, as you know, that has been quoted much, Canon 915, which specifically mm -hmm. says, without actually uh, the need for a, a specific sanction, that anybody who has so publicly and persistently and obstinately persisted in promoting something that is clearly against the fundamental teaching of the church as Governor Cuomo has done and some other politicians, should not uh, receive mm -hmm. Holy Communion. So that's clear, nor uh, should that be administered to that person. And of course, I uh, made that very, very public and, and, uh, and my clergy are, are, are aware mm -hmm. of that. I, I, I understand that Governor um, Cuomo does not actually uh, present himself for communion, and his father didn't either, incidentally, even though he was right. a, a daily mass attendant. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. so that is one kind of there. And then ultimately, uh, it would be up to my judgment or Cardinal Dolan, if he so chose, to decide whether or not it's gotten to a point where something more or severe has to be done. But, uh, yeah. but of course, that's not going to solve the problem that we have in our society of this noxious ideology that continues to, as yeah. we see in a copycat legislation outside of New York, right. uh, it's, uh, it's not just limited to New York. So this is something that has national implications. No, now it's, that we now it's Virginia. It's, it's Rhode Island. It's mm. Virginia. It's spreading everywhere. In fact, I'm going to play you. This is a clip of the governor of Virginia the other day who, mm. uh, you know, has caused social media to explode explaining mm -hmm. his defense of a bill that would allow abortion right up until birth and maybe afterward. Mm -hmm. Listen. If a mother is in labor, I can tell you exactly uh, what would happen. Um, the infant would be delivered. Uh, the infant would be kept comfortable. Uh, the infant would be resuscitated if, if that's what the uh, mother and the family desired. And then a discussion would ensue between the physicians and the mother. Are you disturbed by this trend we're seeing, by this idea coming from uh, duly elected politicians uh, and those responsible yeah, right. for states? I, I, I think every person of good conscience would be disturbed by that. You know, this is not just a Catholic issue or even a Christian issue. Uh, I know atheists against abortion, too, you know, who believe that there is a humanity in an unborn life, you know, the humanity of the unborn life, that is, uh, is something that, that needs to be yeah, respected. And obviously are, laws like yeah, the one in Virginia yeah, clearly don't. And uh, the law in New York State, which removes the former practices whereby a physician would be present uh, at the time of a late-term abortion or even an earlier-term abortion, just in, if, if, the, if, the, if the fetus was viable, to be sure that if the fetus was viable, that it would be tended to. But now that protection is completely removed and, and from the legislation that uh, the governor uh, was quoted to have cited, uh, you can see that not only is that protection removed, but uh, uh, the odds are very, very much against the survival even of a viable uh, live birth. Uh, that's just, no, it's grisly. I mean, that, that shocks the conscience. I mean, that, 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 that is not some, that's not America, and it should not Does be. It the, the, the very idea, though, Bishop, that you have Catholics, and I'm going to play Governor Cuomo here for you just for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, here he is sure. talking about his faith. Um, again, the Catholic, uh, 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 he likes to, to mention his Catholicism, and no doubt that helps him uh, come, come election time. Watch this. I'm a former altar boy, and my relationship with the church uh, is important to me, and I've I've found the differences painful over the years. Uh, he says the church has been against him on things like gay marriage and reproductive rights. How do you respond to that? And, and does the church have a job to educate its members and uh, make them aware of what their public responsibilities are as public officials? Uh, the answer to your second question first, yes, the church has an obligation to educate, I think, not only uh, its own members, but also the general public so that they understand mm -hmm. really where we stand and why we do. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Number two, uh, mm -hmm. what Governor Cuomo, yeah, there are a lot of uh, good Catholics uh, 
that have differences of uh, opinion about certain things the church uh, mm -hmm. does, and even the, what the church teaches. But this is something very, very different. Uh, what uh, Governor Cuomo is doing is he's taking positions and issues that are fundamentally, certainly uh, the sanctity of life, fundamentally against the very core of what Jesus Christ was all about and what the church teaches and what Pope Francis consistently teaches. Uh, to be charitable, it's another form of uh, cafeteria Catholicism, whereby you believe that to be a member of the church is like walking into a cafeteria deciding what you want to eat and what you don't. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't think any faith can possibly, uh, uh, can possibly have much integrity if they have no fundamental principles. And the sanctity of life is a fundamental principle uh, of, our, of, our, of our faith, our belief. But as I said, not only of Catholics, this is something that many people uh, who are not even uh, theists believe that somehow mm -hmm. or other, I mean, the, the, our, our ancestors, the American Indians believed in the sacredness and sanctity of life, you know, mm -hmm. even though they were not uh, mostly Christian. But they had this fundamental respect for nature, uh, for God, mm -hmm. for life. And uh, I don't want to speak, you know, for that community, but, but I think that many, many people of different cultures have a fundamental respect for life, and particularly mm -hmm. in its most vulnerable stages, in yeah. innocent human life. Bishop Edward Scharfenberger of Albany, thank you so much for being here. Thank you also for your thank candor you. and your engagement. Uh, it, it, it's great to see. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. My next guest is the former bishop of Hong Kong and is often called the conscience of China. His was the strongest voice warning the Holy See against a deal with China that would allow the communist government to have a say in the appointment of Catholic bishops. Now, his words fell on deaf ears and the agreement was signed last year. He's now the author of a new book, For Love of My People, I Will Not Remain Silent. He was in Washington this week to receive the Truman Reagan Medal of Freedom for his many years of struggle against the communist Chinese repression. Here with us to give us an update on the persecuted church in his homeland is the Bishop Emeritus of Hong Kong, Joseph Cardinal Zen. Your Eminence, thank you for being here. Your Eminence, since the signing of this secret deal between the Vatican and China in September, and since we last spoke, the government of China has been more determined to restrict religious practice than at any time, certainly in my memory. What was the point of this deal? Uh, maybe uh, our people did not expect such a change of atmosphere. But I think the intention is that China is so big, now it's uh, so open, so uh, they may like to have a better relation with China, so to able to have uh, more opportunity for evangelization. I suppose that's the purpose of the Holy Father. But then uh, I suspect if the people around him uh, have also such a good intention because uh, they know the reality. Uh, so uh, I, I'm re re really amazed how can they encourage the Pope uh, to go on, uh, you know, uh, on that, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, misconcept, misconceived optimism. Yeah. You've written a new book called For Love of My People, I Will Not Remain Silent. You had previously said that if the Vatican signed this concord with the, with the Chinese, you would be silent. What changed? Uh, no. Uh, what I said exactly is that if the Pope uh, does anything uh, I cannot accept in my conscience, I will not come out to fight him. That's the point, yeah. Till now, it uh, seems nothing... Uh, of the kind uh, happened yet. You have blamed the Pope's advisors for steering him in the wrong direction on this deal. In September, Secretary of State Cardinal Parolin announced the agreement between the Holy See and the People's Republic of China this way. The Holy See intends uh, just uh, to create uh, the condition, or to help to create uh, the condition of a greater freedom, autonomy, and organization in order uh, that the Catholic Church uh, can dedicate itself to the mission of uh, announcing the gospel. Has this deal created greater freedom for Catholics or furthered the Church's mission, Your Eminence? I'm sorry to say I don't think he believes in what he says. Parolin has his own agenda. I'm sorry to say that. Yeah. 
I think he has on, uh, his own uh, agenda to achieve a, a diplomatic success. It's a simply a vainglory, I think. Uh, I don't see uh, the purpose for a good of our faith or freedom because uh, he must know the reality. He know the reality, just as much as I know. Yeah. You have called out Cardinal Berylene and have said that what worries you most is his lack of respect for the truth and that he has hid from the pope the horrible face of Chinese communism. Why would he deceive the pope like this? Why would he push for this agreement? Maybe uh, I said something similar is that uh, if everything is secret, then I can still uh, keep talking. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, it, it's really uh, difficult to understand why agreement should be secret. Even if it's a, a provisional, it should be open to everybody because the people in China, they must know what they are supposed to do. They must know what the Holy Father has promised to the Chinese government. So now they are all in the, in the dark. It's, a, it's a, a terrible situation. The details of the deal between the Vatican and China are secret. In a recent interview, you said that this is not a bad thing because it allows for corrections without either party losing face. But can the Vatican actually make corrections? Do they have any real authority within the church in China? Nothing is said yet, but uh, I suspect that, uh, uh, you know, actually there are three things. Uh, one is about the selection of the bishops. And then the second thing is how to deal with those seven illegitimate bishops. And then the third thing is how to deal with the underground church. Now, they say the agreement is only on the first point, but uh, very probably they had some, uh, some kind of uh, understanding already also on the other two points. Because now the government is coming to the people, to the priests especially, and they say, now come up and join the political association. Uh, the, the, the Pope has already agreed, huh? so the people don't know. Actually, uh, already since the beginning of last year, uh, the government came to say to the priest, uh, from the 1st of February uh, to the priest in the end ground, huh? you will no more be tolerated to say mass in private. And the priest uh, told the, uh, the faithful not to go anymore. Maybe it's not yet uh, in, in practice, but uh, uh, that made me believe that uh, some kind of understanding is already there for all the three points. In your book, you write to the priests of China making a plea on their behalf for the Vatican deal not to be signed, and you write this, for you, a new age of the catacombs will begin. It will be winter. It will be hard on you. The government will seize your churches. The priests will no longer be able to administer the sacraments. All that will be left for you is to go home and farm the land. But you will always be priests. Reassure the faithful that God's grace is not tied to the sacraments. God has a thousand ways of filling your hearts with his grace. Sadly, your prophecy, Your Eminence, has come to pass. There are reports that several Chinese priests are, in fact, abandoning their ministries because they feel they can't freely follow their consciences and be members of that Catholic Patriotic Association, the Chinese official version of the church. What becomes of the faithful priests in China? I heard that in one diocese, the, the priests are uh, divided in, in three groups. One group says, now, since the, the Holy Father says it's okay to come out to join the particular association, so why should we not do that? Huh? And I think uh, nobody should uh, blame them. Huh? And then second, we said, no, in our conscience, uh, we cannot accept that because uh, in the letter by uh, Pope Benedict, he said clearly that uh, it's wrong uh, to, to join the patriotic association. And then uh, uh, I, I'm telling them, uh, uh, if you don't join the Petit Association, you surely are not uh, disobeying the Holy Father because I'm sure the Holy Father would not force you to join the Petit Association because the Holy Father is famous for uh, respecting the conscience. Huh? And then, the, unfortunately, there's also a group who said for so many years, uh, 
uh, I try to be a good priest, eh? and now they want me to, to be a priest of the schismatic church. Eh? Uh, so uh, what a purpose to, to be a priest, so they would abandon the priesthood. And that's very, very sad. I hope, uh, yeah, I hope they, they, they think it all over again, yeah. Was this deal supposed to merge the Patriotic Association and the underground church, the faithful church? Nothing is said yet, but uh, I suspect that, uh, uh, you know, actually there are three things. Uh, one is about the selection of the bishops, and then the second thing is how to deal with those seven illegitimate bishops, and then the third thing is how to deal with the underground church. Now, they say the agreement is only on the first point, but uh, very probably they had some, uh, some kind of uh, understanding already also on the other two points. Because now the government is coming to the people, to the priests especially, and they say, now come up and join the political association. Uh, the, the, the Pope has already agreed, huh? so the people don't know. Actually, uh, already since the beginning of last year, uh, the government came to say to the priests, uh, from the 1st of February uh, to the priest in the underground, eh, you will no more be tolerated to say mass in private. And the priest uh, told the, uh, the faithful not to go anymore. Maybe it's not yet uh, in, uh, in practice, but uh, uh, that made me believe that uh, some kind of understanding is already there for all the three points. I read another story, Your Eminence, of another underground bishop who refused to attend the mass celebrated by his Patriotic Association successor. What do you read into that? They stage something very ridiculous. They call it the solemn occasion in which we declare uh, that Bishop Chuang uh, is emeritus. Now, there's no such uh, ceremony anywhere. Huh? It's a uh, insert uh, added to the injury, uh, because this old bishop always resisted to resign to make space to this schismatic bishop. Now uh, he uh, received order, uh, but still nothing is clear, because uh, to recognize this new bishop, we need something which, according to the to the church regulation is a bulla signed by the Pope. And then the bulla must be visible to the people in a function which is called uh, installation. But now there's no such a thing. So there is only a letter signed by Parolin and by Filoni uh, and this uh, ridiculous ceremony uh, uh, in which uh, they say, we honor you because now we recognize you as a bishop, but emeritus. <laughs> That's so ridiculous, yeah, and also uh, very humiliating. Uh. In your book, you propose returning to the 2007 letter of Benedict XVI to the Church in the People's Republic of China for guidance on how to handle Vatican-China relations. Why do you want the Church to return to Benedict's vision of this relationship? Because it was a wonderful letter. Uh, it's a, a masterpiece uh, of uh, clarity of doctrine, and also of, uh, uh, you know, uh, very open attitude of understanding uh, for everybody. And uh, even Pope Francis uh, has said, uh, maybe more than once, that the letter is the valid, uh, because all the wrong things they are doing, because they did not accept the, the, the letter. In my book, you, you notice uh, uh, that uh, they even dared uh, to manipulate the Chinese translation of the letter. Huh? In the Commission for Church in China, uh, somebody, uh, uh, some member of that commission uh, spread the wrong interpretation, and uh, uh, the Vatican allowed him uh, to carry on that, and uh, uh, so only after two years uh, uh, there, there came some uh, correction of, of that opinion. Yeah. Benedict XVI said that the Patriotic Association status was incompatible with Catholic doctrine. What can be done about this deal now? 
I think by now, even the Pope must uh, notice that uh, they got nothing. And even uh, after so much goodwill, uh, they, they had not been rewarded. Immediately after the signing of the agreement, uh, they did so many things which uh, were like uh, uh, slaps in the face of the uh, Holy Father. Because, first of all, they made a public de declaration that they still hold the principle of the independent church. Then they forced the Pope to accept the two bishops who went to the, to the Synod. And then they solemnly celebrated the 60th anniversary of the first illegitimate bishops' consecration. So that's really uh, 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 absolutely uh, rude and polite. Eh? So uh, I, I don't think uh, uh, it's a, a dignified to go on uh, like that. Yeah. Were you surprised by the Pope's tearful welcome of those two Chinese bishops at the Synod, Your Eminence, one of whom, one of these bishops apparently has children of his own in a family? And know that two bishops, actually one uh, was even ordained legitimately, but uh, he, he, he is not working for the church. He's very ambitious. And uh, the other one, uh, the Holy Father just left, uh, lift the, lifted the excommunication uh, a few days ago. Huh? And uh, uh, they say uh, they were invited, but they could not be because uh, uh, the, the Holy See know them very well. They would not uh, propose such names to represent the bishops uh, in China. So obviously, uh, you, no, you have noticed the, the uh, announcement of the two names comes from China, not from the Holy See. So in some way, uh, the Holy Father was forced to accept them because immediately after the signing of agreement, uh, you know, he would be very embarrassed uh, to say no uh, to what they were uh, asking. This past month, Bishop Michael Young, your successor as the Bishop of Hong Kong, passed away. He's been replaced by the retired Cardinal John Tong temporarily, who it is reported was chosen instead of a Bishop Joseph Ha because Tong is more friendly to the Chinese regime. Now, Bishop Ha has been very outspoken. Uh, your thoughts about the situation in your diocese of Hong Kong? But this is, uh, 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 some people say, but actually, actually the, the, such a disposition is uh, okay because, uh, uh, you know, a, a pontifical administrator uh, can do much more for the diocese, for a regular running of the diocese. And uh, uh, Cardinal Tom had just finished being the bishop a uh, little more than one year ago, so he knows all the businesses. So I think uh, it's uh, reasonable uh, because uh, to have a, a diocesan administrator uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, more inconvenient. And then, then uh, uh, it's not uh, sure that uh, uh, Bishop Ha would be uh, the diocesan administrator because uh, uh, it is made by uh, e e election uh, uh, from the, the, the council, uh, diocesan council. And also because in this uh, period, the, the, the principal job is to uh, to work for the, uh, uh, the nomination of the successor. Now, uh, Bishop Ha uh, uh, would be an in mm. interested part. Eh? He could be chosen uh, as mm. uh, the, the successor, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, Cardinal Tom surely is not going to be uh, chosen as successor. So there are many reasons which justify such a disposition. But now, about... Uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 political uh, correctness. Uh, uh, now the, uh, there are many opinions, uh, and uh, some some people even say that uh, uh, since now in China, 
you have all the bishops in the uh, bishops conference uh, legitimized and so uh, probably even the underground bishops would join that uh, conference and so probably also Hong Kong and Macau and eh? the bishop will join the same conference wow. and then the people say in, in that case obviously uh, the future uh, bishop of Hong Kong uh, need to have the blessing for Beijing. Now that's the the uh, the voice, uh, yeah, running in, in opinion in the in the in, in the people. Uh, but uh, uh, you can judge by yourself. <laughs> Cardinal Zen, what are members of the underground church telling you? Do they feel abandoned by Rome? They say horrible uh, voice uh, of despair, uh, of uh, confusion. They really don't know what to do. We are all in the dark, you see? We are all in the dark, uh, yeah. So it's, it's very strange that uh, the agreement should be secret. Uh? So uh, the secret may be uh, <laughs> the, 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 they are both uh, the Holy See and Chinese government, um, they may not fear, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the right position. Uh? So, uh, they are afraid of uh, uh, many criticisms. What do you tell people who ask you for guidance as far as what they should do? I said just uh, moments ago, I said, uh, if you think it's good for you to go into the open, it's okay. Because if the present pope says it's okay, you can do it. Huh? But if in your conscience, you think it's wrong because you cannot be united with a schismatic church. Then you have to obey to your conscience because the conscience is still the, 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 the last criterion for your action. And uh, the Pope tells all the, the governments in the world that they, they should respect the conscientious objection. Eh? So the Pope would not force you uh, to join the particular association. And uh, okay. Uh, the government is going to take your church. Uh, you're not no more allowed to say mass uh, for the people. Okay, you go home and wait for better times. Eh? The communism is not eternal. What else I cannot say? In February, the Vatican will host its summit on sex abuse, as we've been reporting, and you know. Are you content that they have properly diagnosed the problem? They've, they've sort of narrow cast this as the protection of minors. Or is the problem the abuse of people by bishops and the abuse of power and the discipline of bishops? I think both are very important. Both are essential. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, prevention is uh, uh, very important uh, uh, because uh, uh, it, it uh, concerns the, the formation uh, of the people in the church uh, and then also the working in so many institutions, uh, and uh, uh, I, I think that's important, but also uh, the responsibility of the bishops. Uh, when such uh, 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 scandal happen, uh, they have to be, uh, you know, uh, more uh, straightforward in, uh, in dealing with the cases, yeah. I think both are important. Your Eminence, thank you so much for joining us this evening. The book, For Love of My People, I Will Not Remain Silent, on the Situation of the Church in China, by Cardinal Joseph Zen, is available at bookstores everywhere and online, February 5th, from Ignatius Press. And finally, he's the author of the best-selling Inheritance series that took readers to the world of Aragon and Allegasia. His love of folklore and reading, not to mention homeschooling, enabled him to graduate high school at 15 and embark on an incredible literary career. He would go on to sell tens of millions of books in his series. I sat down with him recently in Washington to talk about great storytelling and his new epic fantasy novel, The Fork, The Witch, and The Worm. Here's my exclusive interview with Christopher Paolini. Christopher, welcome to the show. Uh, it has been eight years since your last book, Inheritance. 
What have you been doing in the meantime? <laughs> uh, well, thank you for having me. Uh, I didn't have a beard back then. That was one difference. Well, that eight years will do that to uh, eight you. Eight years will do that. Um, <laughs> Mainly, I spent a good chunk of my life writing The Inheritance Cycle, mm -hmm. starting with Aragon in 1998, and then the last book, Inheritance, in 2011. And that took me from 15 to 27, 28. Wow. So when I finished the last book, I needed a break. Yeah. And I spent some time working on other projects, a screenplay, some short stories. And I've also been working on a massive science fiction novel full of spaceships, lasers, aliens, and explosions, and tentacles. Oh, Lots of tentacles. And, and that's coming out... When? I don't know, but I'm just finishing up a, a rewrite on it, and hopefully people will get to see that before too long. Okay, I've got to ask you about the new book, and I love the cover, I love the size of this, The Fork, The Witch, and The Worm. Yes. Tell the audience where this story came from. You did not intend <laughs> to continue on with the series that you'd spent the bulk of your life writing and creating. No. Um, however, like so many readers, okay. I fell in love with the characters in the world, and in the years mm. since, I keep thinking about them. I'd be falling asleep, and every once in a while I'd think, I miss Aragon and Safira. What are they up to? What are they doing? Uh, and the, the initial spark for this book actually came about about two years ago. I had a, or no, about a year ago, I had a fan tweet to me huh. saying, uh, hey, what is the character of Murtag doing? And I don't know, I had too much coffee, it was late at night. And <laughs> so you answered them. I answered, and I said, oh, he's fighting a bunch of enemies with a magic fork that he named Mr. Stabby. <laughs> And, you know, writers are strange creatures. I couldn't stop thinking about how I could actually turn that into a story. And I had a couple other ideas, and it evolved from there. And Mr. Stabby now <laughs> has his own first chapter in the exactly. new book. Uh, exactly. Give me a sense of why three short stories? Why didn't you devote time to continuing the series uh, or, or, or filling in gaps in the series? Uh, and I don't know how many gaps there are, <laughs> considering everything you've... I mean, the books are yeah. this big. They're uh, biblical. Because the... Because... Writing a story that takes a million words to tell, which is what the inheritance cycle is, mm. is a huge time commitment. You're looking at about a decade of your life. Yeah. And uh, some of these ideas are not large enough to support a whole story, uh, a whole book, mm -hmm. uh, but they're still interesting stories in their own right. Mm. And I also. And they're all set in the world of Alligator. And they're all yeah, set in yeah. the world, and there's battles and dragons and all sorts of cool stuff in the book. Even if you haven't read the inheritance cycle, you would still enjoy this book. Mm -hmm. And as a storyteller, I really challenged myself to try to tell some stories that had a beginning, a middle, in an end, and that didn't take a million words to actually tell. Yeah. And I was very happy with how they turned out. Now, your sister, Angela, who is a longtime collaborator with you yes. on this series, I mean, she, she and you really mind-melded. And we're going to talk a little bit about the entire family dynamic, really, mm. that has supported not only this series, but advanced it, and you as a writer. But d d tell me about this relationship with your sister. Um, she wrote the middle chapter of this book on the witch. Yes. Now, the herbalist, the traveling herbalist, see how nice I'm being with the <laughs> witch, uh, the traveling herbalist in the book is also named Angela. Yes. Your sister couldn't have been too happy becoming the, Fortunately, she the has witch. a good sense of humor okay. about this, or I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Um, <laughs> and you're right, we've collaborated for years behind the scenes. Mm. I always bounce story ideas off of her. She's one of my first readers. Mm. She has an incredible mind for story, and she's a good writer in her own right, as I think okay. people will see with this story. Yeah. So having the chance here to collaborate like this was a really fun opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I have to give her credit, because it's a very difficult thing to come into someone else's world with an established character and work in that world and make the tone and the voice fit, and I think mm. she did a really good job. So I, she had the initial idea for the story, and then I had the overall structure for The Fork, the Witch, and the Worm. And, and then you kind of put the Aragon frame around bingo. the entire, the, the, the three, the triptych, if you will. Yes, exactly. Give me a sense of that relationship, how you all work together, because it's much more than this work. I mean, mm. you worked for years yeah. um, on, on this enormous series, and I imagine you, are, is she collaborating with you also on the sci-fi series and the other things? Well, the sci-fi series, we actually have created a shared science fiction universe that encompasses the real world that both of us can write and tell stories in. Wow. So all this came about because we were homeschooled, and we were growing up in Montana mm. and telling each other stories, finding ways to entertain ourselves out by the Yellowstone River with the... Oh. Uh, the mountains of the valley next to us, uh, mm. absolutely gorgeous place to live. Uh, and we've always been a tight-knit family and always wanted to find ways to work together as a business, as a family, yeah. uh, and as storytellers. So you, you, you presaged my next question, <laughs> which was about how did homeschooling yeah. prepare you for this? And really, I was stunned to learn, I didn't know until I was preparing for the interview, your entire family 
was not only a part of this, they got together, they published, self-published the first book. Yeah. You know, I didn't see it till Random House uh, produced it. But give me, give me a sense of that dynamic and what that's meant to you as a writer, the well, safety and security. That that's, a, that's a big question. Um, my parents have always been self-employed. Uh, none of us like to do what other people tell us to do. So <laughs> we are always looking for things to do as a family. And when I handed over Aragon, the first draft, my, it was my parents said, we think there's something actually here. Maybe we can publish this together, self-publish, and see mm -hmm. what we can do with it. I've been enormously lucky to have that support from my family over the years. Um, you know, I... I've had enough of the sort of crazy public attention that I know that I can see look like young musicians and actors and stuff and know a little bit of what they've gone through. And I know if it hadn't been for my family, it would have been very difficult to deal with that pressure and also just to finish writing the books and stuff. Right. So both my parents are uh, devoted readers and so mm -hmm. Good readers make for good editors, yeah. and that's they were my first editors. They were able, even if they didn't always know how to fix something, what the problem was, they could they could tell you it's not working here, uh -huh. and then I could figure it out and improve it from uh -huh. there. Any time I interview an author that has created an iconic character like this, uh, I'm thinking of um, James Lee Burke and his Dave Roba show series, mm -hmm. and I know it's I know Aragon is not you. But there are threads of us sure. that we see on rereading yeah. that the author does bleed into that. I know with Will Wilder, I see shards of myself all over yeah. that character. What of Aragon do you find now as you read it as an adult? Well, I, I mean, I won't lie. Me. Aragon started as me. Uh -huh. I think the easiest thing for a 15-year-old boy to write about is a 15-year-old boy. <laughs> yeah. um, However, if you're being honest about your characters and your story, as your characters do things that you've never done and experiencing things that you've never experienced, like riding a dragon or fighting a monster, they become very much their own person. I'd say the traits that I share the most with Aragon these days are his um, continual desire to learn and the fact that he's always asking questions. If you look at his dialogue over the course of the books, mm. most of his dialogue in the first four books is questions. Because he's growing yeah. up, he's learning about the world. Mm. Uh, and he has a sense of optimism and hope about the world that I, I think we need more of and that mm. I try mm. to maintain in myself even when I get grouchy about deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling. Yeah, I love the idea also. Um, you immersed yourself in this world as much as you could at a very young age. I mean, you learned how to forge your own uh, swords, yeah. uh, weave things by hand. Why go through that intensive preparation, I guess? Um, it's, as an amateur, it's fairly easy to learn a good chunk of a certain skill or topic mm -hmm. quickly. Yeah. It's very hard to master it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know much about playing a guitar, but I bet if I spent two, three days reading about it and watching videos, I'd have a good idea of the basics. I'd be a horrible player, but I have a good <laughs> idea of the basics. And I love learning. So for me, the writing is often an excuse to dabble in different things, whether it's art, whether it's forging swords, making mm -hmm. knives, that sort of thing. And I find that if you have a little bit of physical experience with something, it really aids in writing about it. You know, if mm -hmm. I'd grown up in New York City, I might still have written fantasy, yeah. but I doubt it would have been as outdoor-centric as yeah. it is now, or that I would have had even the physical details that would make it feel authentic. Well, you also grew up in a place where there are geysers, there are, yeah. you know, you've got the, I mean, the, the nature speaks and moves with you it in does. a place like Montana. And you're right, you're right near Yellowstone, right? Oh yeah, 40 minutes away. Oh, so, so, I mean, anybody who's been there, it is it And, is and you don't an awesome really have place. a Disney view of nature if uh -huh. you've grown up around foxes and wolves and badgers and mm. your pet dog will sometimes bring small furry things <laughs> back to chew on and things like that. Uh, but it does give you an appreciation of the beauty of nature and also the unforgiving nature of nature. You know, mm. you make a mistake when you're up hiking in the woods, and if you're not prepared, you're... You, even in this day and age, you can you can pay dearly for that. Wow. What was it about folklore? I know folklore mm. and myth really drew you at a young age. What was it about those types of stories yeah. that drew you? Be I think those stories have endured because they talk about universal human experiences, whether that's adolescence mm -hmm. for men or for women, boys or girls, or responsibility or honor or uh, the questions of existence and meaning and morality. And the reason the archetypes are archetypes is because they deal with those questions in ways that resonate even to this day. And so mm. for me, reading these fables, these myths, these legends, even including like Beowulf, for example, or mm. uh, 
you know, all sorts of mythology in Europe and stuff. Mm. It helped me understand the world. And mm. as a result, I wanted to write about those sorts of things because they resonated with me. Uh, and I think, I think science fiction is sort of the modern version of that in some ways. Yeah. Um, although a lot of science fiction doesn't draw from those older traditions either and yeah. moves in a new direction. But Was it a hard leap for you going from this fantasy genre to sci-fi? Um, or is it all still story? It's all still story. I'd say that the nicest thing about it was being able to use a modern vocabulary because mm -hmm. there are lots of words I can't yeah. use in fantasy. Uh, the most difficult part is that in fantasy, if you need to get from point A to point B a little faster, you can say that, oh, you spurred your horses on a little harder, right? You know, because it's, <laughs> yeah. it's an emergency. Uh, spaceships don't move any faster than mm. they can. Their top speed is their top speed. And yeah. so that was a real limiting factor. But it, it was a fun challenge. <laughs> Who thought that horses would be, you know. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, uh, give, give you a wider berth to, to, to play with. What would you tell the young writers mm. who were perhaps 15 years old? and wanting to write. What would be your advice to those aspiring writers? I would say learn everything you can about the language you're writing in. That's the tool of the trade. Mm -hmm. Read everything you can, both things you enjoy and things that um, are outside your normal interest range, mm. so you keep learning. <laughs> Plot your stories out beforehand. That's your ah. roadmap. If, you don't do, if I don't do that, I can't write. So know what mm. you're going to write before you write it. Write about the things you enjoy the most. There are seven billion some people on the planet. No matter what you like, I guarantee there are millions of people that, you, that care about the same things. And writing's hard. Yeah. So if you really care about the subject material, that will get you through the work. Do you enjoy this part of it? This is a hard <laughs> transition for some. Because I'm on TV and I'm a public figure, I, I, I don't mind going back and forth to the two worlds. But I have a lot of writer friends. They like their cocoon, yeah. and they don't like to emerge from it because it it throws your rhythm off, your 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 discipline off, mm -hmm. and you're out of your element. Do you find that? I would say I'm very fortunate to be able to do this, and any mm -hmm. author who has this opportunity is fortunate. I've been doing the promotion for a long time. Yeah. I do enjoy it. I enjoy getting to meet the fans. I enjoy getting to talk about the books. Mm. It is a disruption in one hand, yeah. um, but I am an introvert who can fake extroversion. <laughs> These are the kind of interviews I like to do. Tell me the major themes in this book. What uh, should people be looking for here that they might not find in the Aragon series, or haven't found. There are themes of uh, forgiveness, honor, responsibility, and especially in the last story, the biggest one, mm. the worm mm. part, uh, questions of how do we deal with the big things in life that you can't change? Because mm. we all face those issues. The things you can't change, but you still have to face and you still have to wrestle with. Yeah. Um, all of that wrapped up with dragons and swords and magic. And yeah, well, that, that's what I love about fantasy. It, it allows us, we, we take a break but we're really going deeper into life and to ourselves. Fantasy allows you to externalize what is otherwise internal. Mm. So if your character is, for example, scared of spiders, in a fantasy novel they can encounter a spider that's as big as a house. And that's an easy example, but yeah. that's one of the things I love about fantasy. No, it's a lot of fun for the readers and, and, and for the yeah, authors. Exactly. Okay, there are questions I ask every author that sits in that chair. Mm -hmm. um, I founded a literacy campaign called Storyented because I believe every story orients us in the world, mm. shows us our way in some ways. And, and if you find your story, you'll find your way. So I'm gonna ask you, your favorite children's book and why? Ooh, um, The Wizard of Earthsea Trilogy by Ursula K. Le Guin. I'm, gonna, I'm cheating, that's three books. I know, well, but it, we get it. But they For deal, you, that's one book. <laughs> yes, they deal with honor, responsibility, questions of mortality. Mm. Um, and I, I, I think she writes basically poetry as prose. Yeah, and uh, I, I recommend it to everyone who reads fantasy and who hasn't read it. What is your least favorite book? I choose not to answer. <laughs> <laughs> the, I love the diplomats that sit here. I get all the diplomats. Uh, the story that helped you find your path and the lesson you derived from it. Ooh. Um, the Worm Ouroboros by E. R. Edison. Oh, which I don't is, know that one. It is a pre-Tolkien novel it, written in the 1900s, written in faux Jacobian English. Oh my gosh. Uh, it took me three tries to get through the darn thing. Okay, um, what did you learn? I learned about the importance of beauty. Mm. Beauty of action, beauty of thought, and beauty for beauty's sake. Um, mm. Not necessarily as a m system of morals, but um, as a way of approaching the world and my work and everything I do in my life. Mm. Where do you write and why? 
I write in Montana. I write in my office. I write at my desk or in my on my sofa. Uh -huh. I listen to music while I write, and I write there because it is quiet. My family's close at home, mm. and it nurtures my soul to be in the natural environment. There. Music with lyrics or just orchestral? Uh, usually movie soundtracks. No lyrics. No lyrics that I can understand. Ah, uh, this is how I write. Yes. Thank you. I, if there's a lyric, I can't. Uh, I can't it, focus. It, it, no, it rattles in my well, head. It's like I my sister write. can write in um, coffee shops with people talking around her. I cannot. You can't focus. do that. No. See, I wrote half of my books there because they claim that because it's a low hum, it causes the brain to engage. I read. I've read studies on this. If it's low enough Hopkins. hum, it does work. In right. fact, there is a couple of websites that provide like white noise generators, and one of the right. white noise options is like low grade coffee noise conversation. Ah. And that can work, but if I can understand the words, and it just bothers my brain. Throws you off. Yeah. You know, if Mabel and Gertrude are blabbing at each other, I'm, I'm lost. And I live in New Orleans where everybody <laughs> talks really loud. Yes. It doesn't work. Yes. Um, give me a sense of where your best ideas come from. Usually the shower and or right when I'm falling asleep. Um, also, and this might sound strange, but, you know, the more I read and, and, and watch movies and stuff, perfect stories don't inspire me. But stories where there's, because perfection is untouchable. You look at it and you go, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, I have no idea how they did it, I can't get my fingers in it. Uh -huh. But something that's flawed, you know something's wrong, and then it gets you thinking about how to fix it, how mm. else you could approach that subject material. And that I find enormously inspiring. Why do you still live with your whole family? You still live with your parents yeah. in Montana. Because I don't have a family of my own, mm -hmm. and I travel a huge amount, and yeah. so going back to Montana is a nice home base, you know? Mm. And we do have a family business we work on together, so that yeah. helps. But I've lived in San Diego, I've lived in New York City, I've lived in Barcelona, I've lived in Edinburgh in the winter, which Ooh. I do not recommend. No. Um, but I always come back to Montana, because at heart, I am a country boy. Ah, I love that. Uh, if you could pick a writing mentor, alive or dead, who would it be? Ooh, a writing mentor. Um, well, I think it would be a lot of fun to talk with E.R. Edison, who wrote The Worm Ouroboros, and also Mervyn Peake, who wrote The, oh, Gorm yeah. or, uh, the, the Gormenghast Trilogy. Yep. Uh, and of course, I would never say no to sitting down with Tolkien. Oh, who would? <laughs> Maybe the, the pipe smoke might annoy you a little bit. Eh, but, I, yeah. I could put up with that for you a conversation. Could, you could do that. That's right. Advice to parents who are trying to get their kids to read, what would you tell them? Encourage. You know, don't, even if you don't like what the child has, your child has written, don't say, that's bad. Don't ever give the child a sense that because the writing needs work, that they've done a bad thing. Mm. Um, but in general, just providing the tools that are going to allow for creativity. You know, whether that means books on writing or just having the tools to write around yeah. or maybe introducing your children to someone who can help edit their work or mm -hmm. editing their mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. um, just mainly being encouraging. You know, writing is hard enough on its own without someone else telling you, yeah. don't do this or, you know, criticizing yeah. you in some way. Yeah. You do need constructive criticism, just like if you want to be a musician or mm -hmm. you want to be a visual artist. You need constructive instru instruction. But... Um, you know, artists can be fickle things, uh, writers can be fickle things, and... You and very can, tender. And very tender. So it is mm. a balancing act. And as you get more experience, you get tougher. Yeah. Someone can come to me and give me the most direct, harshest, brutal criticism now in my writing, and I'm like, yes, thank you, I can get better. I needed that, But yeah. if you did that to me 15, 20 years ago, it would have been very hard to deal with. Hmm. If you could write anything else, what would it be? Everything. I have so many stories I want to tell. Science fiction, romance, historical novel, thriller, every, I just need more time. Mm. That's, time is the limiting factor. And I'm a fast writer, believe it or not, but mm. it is the limiting factor. Can you only do one thing at a time? Do you only yeah. write one book at a yeah, time? I'm, you can't put your head in. Well, Fork Witch Worm was written while I was working on my science fiction novel, but mm. while working on Fork Witch Worm, I stopped all work on the sci-fi novel. Ah. So I have a one-track mind. Uh, mm. It works very well on one track, but I can't multitask. Mm. Christopher, thank you so much for the time. The Fork, the Witch, and the Worm. It's My such pleasure. a fantastic read. Thank you for being here. Thank you. For your candor. Visit paolini.net for all the details of Christopher's tour. And someone else will be going on tour as well on February 19th, book three of the Will Wilder series. Will Wilder, the amulet of power hit stores. But you can pre-order your copy now at all the usual outlets and visit willwilderbooks.com. I'll have some special offers to announce next week 
for those of you who pre-order, and I'll tell you about the tour. We'll have a great time. That is all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. You can like me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. And be sure to join us next week. Megan Cox Gurdon will join us to discuss the power of reading aloud to your children and the connections it makes in their brain. It's an incredible new book, The Enchanted Hour. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. See you next time. Bye now.